It is a delight to be here to speak with you. Um, obviously, I am in Boston and not at Stanford, but I was very, very much looking forward to being Dr. Stanford at Stanford. So um, that I'm sure is a rare find. Um, so I feel like I'm there in spirit, even though I'm not there. If you hear lots of wind, we have a gale warning issue going on. It is 11 degrees in Boston, which I'm sure is not where it, what it is in um, in the Silicon Valley um, you know, Bay Area at all. Um, so this is me. Um, today we're going to be presenting on race and medicine, our legacy here in the United States. And it is my goal that by the end of this presentation that you've learned, you know, things about me, which is, is fine, but learned about what, how we can make progress as it relates to issues surrounding race equity, particularly in this field that we call medicine. So these are my disclosures. I'm a consultant for Calibrate, GoodRx, and Novo Nordisk. I receive research support from Amazon. Um, these will not reflect on anything that I say today. So we do have a few um, objectives for today, and they are as follows. We're going to describe obstacles associated with progress um, during the life course here in academia. Um, and we're going to explore the role of race and ethnicity and gender in medicine and science. We're going to discuss strategies to navigate dis disequilibrium that's encountered in academic life. And then I'm going to finally close with proposing potential solutions to drive sustainable change in the field. So I'm going to take you back a little bit to my childhood and take you through my upbringing, because I think this will set the framework for how I navigate my life in medicine. Um, so this is actually me. This is my earliest memory in life. I was five months of age. This was the day of my christening. I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. I remember this distinctly um, from the vantage point, like I'm looking at you now so I can't see myself. Um, my mom and my maternal grandmother were trying to arrange me for this picture so it would look, I guess, however they wanted it to look for um, the, the pictures. And I just remember thinking, you know, can they just get this together? I, you know, I, I think I'll look fine in the pictures. Um, and so, you know, you see this young black girl um, and, you know, this is, I looked really excited about just really tackling the world. I mean, I didn't know what I was to expect um, because I was five months of age, first of all. So that that's one thing. This is me with my maternal grandmother. This is me at around the age of three. So I think I'm starting to figure things out about kind of how, how challenging the world can be. My grandmother seems to be pretty excited about life here. I really credit my maternal grandmother with where I am today. Um, she was a first grade school teacher and she taught me all of first grade and between kindergarten and first grade. So I went to first grade and knew everything. I stayed in first grade for a week and then I went to second grade. And then when I got to second grade, they were like, well, she knows all of second grade, but my parents wouldn't let them move me further because they were worried about my development, my ability to um, really be with my peers um, from more of a, a maturity standpoint. So I just skipped that one grade, but I really thank my maternal grandmother for that. Um, my mom would say here, what did they do to my baby? You know, why was I looking so mean? But this is kind of my, my take um, on life. And um, that's, that's really kind of the seriousness that I would approach everything with. So, you know, let's take you to my four-year-old class and actually had a, a chance to reacquaint myself with my four-year-old teacher right before the pandemic in December of 2019. Um, and I thought this was quite interesting because, you know, how your parents view you, how your parents explain you is one thing. They obviously have some strong biases. You're their child. Um, but it was interesting to see what did my four-year-old teacher, who now sees me in my 40s for the first time, um, how did she see me? How did she view me, you know, then after having taught over 50 different classes of four-year-olds? Um, and so this is my teacher. This is me actually right behind the sign. I remember this day very clearly. This is the early 80s, as you can see. Um, I remember them telling us where we were going to sit. And I told the photographer, I would like to be directly behind the sign. And the teacher was just like, just let her be where she wants to be. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, and you can see me here. Um, I was at an all black private school um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, as you can see here in the pictures, um, many of my peers look like me. And then I would be remiss if I did not talk about my little sister who got married yesterday in the middle of me meeting with many of your lovely um, faculty, staff, professors, et cetera. 
here at the lovely Stanford Medical School. So this is my sister. You can see that we were in our uniforms, really excited to tackle um, the world. So that's really kind of the fun and games. But let's get into some serious business as we really look at this issue of race. And I think it's important for us to, to look at this picture that we see here. We see the picture of the Klan. And I was intentional in putting a picture of the Klan here with a cross that's burning because one of my earliest memories in life as a three-year-old in Atlanta, Georgia, was waking up to a cross burning on my lawn in Atlanta, Georgia. So the question that I pose on this slide is as follows. How do the parents of young black and brown girls and boys prepare them for the world they now inherit? So it wasn't a situation of my parents having to decide at what age they begin to speak with me about race I was acquainted with this as I was looking at the Klan burn across on my lawn. And very quickly, as a Black girl, you have to learn that because of your skin, you're going to be viewed differently. You're going to be valued differently, unfortunately, here in the United States. So very early acquaintance, and maybe as you looked at that picture of me kind of frowning with my maternal grandmother, that was around the time that this actually occurred in my life. So I want to take some time to talk about systemic racism. I'm going to play this out. I'm going to ask Dr. Ren and Dr. Han to kind of put thumbs up to make sure that the sound is coming through. Um, but I think that this will kind of give us some ideas to think about systemic racism in this particular cartoon. This is Jamal. Jamal is a boy who lives in a poor neighborhood. He has a friend named Kevin who lives in a wealthy neighborhood. All of Jamal's neighbors are African-American and all of Kevin's neighbors are white. Because Jamal's school district is mostly funded by property taxes, his school is not very well funded. His classrooms are overcrowded, his teachers are underpaid, and he doesn't have access to high quality tutors or extracurricular activities. Kevin's school district is also funded by property taxes, so his school is very well funded. His classrooms are never crowded, his teachers are very well paid, and he has access to high quality tutors and lots of extracurricular activities. Kevin and Jamal live only a few streets away from each other. So how come they're growing up in such different worlds with such different opportunities for success? The answer has to do with America's history of systemic racism. To understand it better, let's look at what life was like for Kevin and Jamal's grandparents. Decades after the Civil War, Many government agencies started to draw maps dividing cities into sections that were either desirable or undesirable for investment. This practice was called redlining, and it usually blocked off entire Black neighborhoods from access to private and public investment. Banks and insurance companies used these maps for decades to deny Black people loans and other services based purely on race. Historically speaking, owning a home and getting a college education is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. But when Jamal's grandparents wanted to buy a house, the banks refused because they lived in a neighborhood that was redlined. So Jamal's grandparents were not able to buy a home. And because colleges could prevent them from attending through legal segregation, their options for higher education were really scarce. Kevin's grandparents, on the other hand, got a low interest loan to buy their first house and got accepted into a handful of top universities, which traditionally only accepted white students. This opened up a wealth of opportunities that they were able to pass on to their kids and grandkids. Even as late as the 1980s, an investigation into the Atlanta real estate market showed that banks were more willing to lend to low-income white families than to middle or upper-income African-American families. As a result, today, for every $100 of wealth held by a white family, black families have $5.04. A 2017 study confirms that redlining is still affecting home values in major cities like Chicago today. This explains how Kevin and Jamal inherited vastly different circumstances. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. A big part of systemic racism is implicit bias. These are prejudices in society that people are not aware that they have. Let's go back to Kevin and Jamal. Against all odds, Jamal manages to be the only student from his high school to get accepted into a great university, the same one that Kevin and his high school friends are attending. But after Kevin and Jamal both graduate, Jamal notices that his resume isn't drawing as much interest as Kevin's, even though they graduated from the same program with the exact same GPA. Unfortunately for Jamal, studies show that resumes with white-sounding names get twice as many callbacks as identical resumes with black-sounding names. 
Implicit bias is one of the reasons why the Black unemployment rate is twice the rate of white unemployment, even among college graduates today. You can see evidence of systemic racism in every area of life. The disparities in family wealth, incarceration rates, political representation, and education are all examples of systemic racism. Unfortunately, the biggest challenge with systemic racism is that there's no single person or entity responsible for it, which makes it very hard to solve. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is work towards becoming more aware of your own implicit biases. What are some prejudices that you might hold that you're not aware of? Second, let's acknowledge that the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow laws are still affecting access to opportunity today. As a result, we should support systemic changes that create more equal opportunities for everyone. Increasing public school funding and making it independent from property taxes would be a great start so that poor and wealthy districts can receive equal access to resources. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Luckily, we're all part of the system, which means that we all have a role to play in making it better. Peace. All right. So, you know, we've learned a little bit about systemic racism, implicit bias. I, I want to add to that explicit bias, um, you know, like I experienced you know, starting very young in life. Um, I, I, you know, bring you to my middle school years. And I think it's important, you know, they talked about Atlanta. Um, my zip code that I grew up in actually has more doctors, more black doctors per capita than anywhere in the United States which means that you have a certain level of wealth um, within that community. And they talked about, um, one of the communities they were talking about when they were talking about who had access to loans were some of these upper middle class or even upper class um, areas that are predominantly black in the city of Atlanta. Now this is, I've always been a speaker. This was me at the age of 12. Um, I kind of looked the same in my forties um, as I did at 12, but I want you to notice this Confederate flag that's right behind me. It's very interesting that my parents were able to pull this picture and we were able to see that the Confederate flag was over the state of Georgia for most of my life um, there. And, you know, this was just a backdrop. This is what you saw everywhere you went. Um, my school was at that point, I left um, private school to go into the Atlanta public school system. Um, and so this was exactly, you know, what you saw. I was also a cheerleader. So I um, had some time there um, doing that type of work. Um, but let's go into my time in science. My introduction to science was really early. So after I finished my middle school years, I went into the Academy of Math and Science at Benjamin Elijah Mays High School, a high school um, that is in Atlanta Public Schools. And Benjamin Elijah Mays, for those of you who are not aware, was Martin Luther King Jr.'s teacher. So he, he is um, the orator um, by which my school was named after. And what I really liked about my school was that it had exposure to predominantly black um, you know, student body to early education in terms of sciences. So my first NIH research funding, I got at the age of 14. This is me here at that age. Um, working in this particular project, which I presented as a representative of the United States at ISEF, for those of you that were ISEF um, participants, and that's the International Science and Engineering Fair, um, where I was able to present that work um, back in the, the mid-90s. I went on to become valedictorian of my high school class um, and was featured in USA Today, Ebony Magazine, et cetera, as one of the top high school students in the um, and the United States, and that was great and all, but I knew that um, I would face some challenges. Um, I re recognized that very early in life. I told you was starting around the age of three that I recognized that I would not be valued for who I was. I did apply to 69 different schools, got full scholarships to 50 of them, and so did have my pick of institutions um, when I was going to school. And I chose to attend Emory, um, which was where I had started with my early research endeavors. Um, but I can remember early on in my education, actually in the, in the first year, I was in a class with um, some students. And I remember a young white woman who was in my class saying that she wished that when she was applying to Emory that she had been able to put that she was a black female. Um, because if she had been able to put that down on her application, she presumes that she would have had a better chance of getting in and getting scholarship dollars. 
by which I immediately responded to her that I don't know what her GPA or her SAT score was, but I can ensure hers that mine was better than hers. But the, so the assumption that just because I'm sitting in that room um, that I must have lesser qualifications um, is really a fallacy and born out of that implicit and explicit bias that many individuals have. Um, here me, here's me with uh, quite a few of the um, leaders in the institution, Dr. Janetta Cole, who was president of Spelman College, but then came on faculty at Emory, um, Dr. Darnita Killian, who was the dean of students there. I did pledge one of the historically black um, sororities, Delta Sigma Theta, and it was a, really a source of um, significant camaraderie amongst my colleagues but also served as the president of the Inner Sorority Council. So I oversaw both of the historically black and historically white sororities on campus as they're the first um, black president of that organization. Soon after I did complete my first master's, I'm working on my third now. So Sherry will have more things to add. Um, I finish on May 11th with my third master's, but um, this is right as I was finishing my first master's in public health, which I did at Emory also. Um, I received the Gold Congressional Award, which was presented to the, my congressman, John Lewis. Um, so I grew up in John Lewis's congressional district. His son actually went to my high school. And I remember when John Lewis gave me this award this day, and he stated the following to me, and I will never forget it. Obviously, he's no longer here with us. We lost him last year. Um, but he said, Fatima, never stop fighting injustice. And I told him he had nothing to worry about. That is not something that I plan on doing during my lifetime. I will continue to fight for injustice, but you can imagine receiving those words from a great civil rights leader, John Lewis, someone who my family knew well, someone who had my father's artwork in his office, really resonated with me and definitely reflects how I think about the work that I do in this space. Um, this is when I got married in 2001, 10 days before 9-11. So 9-11, I was supposed to come home for my honeymoon that day. Obviously did not come home because they just grounded all air travel everywhere in the world. But so every every step of my, my life, you can imagine there's like kind of a big event that occurs, you know, 9-11 um, actually being obviously a, a, a start um, to, to my life as a married person. And so as I celebrate 20 years this year, I always know exactly how long 9-11 was in terms of its, its um, major impact on our country and our world, because it's literally um, just a few days from my actual wedding anniversary. And so after doing my MPH, um, working in public health, I worked at a rape crisis center for two years, um, the DeKalb Rape Crisis Center as their prevention coordinator. I was one of two consultants, the National Centers for Victims of Crime, for rape and sexual assault here in the United States, um, worked at the CDC. I'd helped develop the content for the first website for women's health here in the United States at the CDC, and then worked at the American Cancer Society, uh, looking at disparities and issues such as breast cancer, for example. So you can see that was my setup, my introduction in public health. And then after doing that work, I did what I wanted to do since I was three or four, which was to go to medical school. And so here is me um, as, um, class president, I decided to run for president of my class. We'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Um, you can see me here amongst my classmates. It's not really hard to find me. This is my family, my sister, which you guys saw earlier. She's a little bit older than the picture there. My mom, my dad, my husband. Um, and it was really exciting to finally get to medical school. And so when I decided to run for the president of the class, I was, you know, excited. There were, I knew that it was an uphill battle potentially to be elected president of the class. Um, our medical school, the Medical College of, of Georgia, was founded in 1828, so obviously in the middle of the antebellum South. And when I did win the presidency as the first slash only person to be president of the medical school class to date, um, this was in the early 2000s. Um, I was quickly called by the historian of the university, and she wanted to take me on a tour of the archives of the university. She was really excited to share this with me. She was one of the first women graduates of the Medical College of Georgia. So it was really just very excited. So when she took me on a tour of the archives, I then began to quickly notice that this black gentleman was in all of the pictures. And I was just confused because this was 1828, 1830, 1835. If you guys know anything about US history, we know that slavery was very much alive and well in the American South where I was born and raised. And so I 
think that that's exactly what she expected that I would see as we took a tour of the um, university. And so I asked her, well, who's that gentleman? She said, oh, you know, Fatima, I'm so glad that you asked me who that gentleman is. That gentleman's name is Grandison Harrison. And he was a slave that was purchased by the anatomy and physiology department for the sole purpose of robbing the black grave sites, as you can see here, for them to have bodies by which to study anatomy and physiology. Appalled, but not surprised, I felt that it was prudent. And if you guys, for the medical people that are listening, those that are in practice, those that are medical students, for example, you know that one of the major events that the first year medical students um, conduct is the cadaver memorial ceremony. And I thought it was really a travesty that this gentleman who had, had been purchased and his whole sole responsibility was to rob grave sites by which to learn anatomy had never been recognized formally by the institution. As president of the class, I thought it was prudent for me to definitely recognize this gentleman for his contributions. Um, when I took this to the class as a whole, um, there were 17 class officers particularly that I took this to. They were very alarmed that I would want to recognize this gentleman for his contributions. They said I was bringing up dirty laundry of the institution and that we should definitely not recognize him. Um, as the president, I, I really took an executive privilege and said, no, we will definitely recognize him you know, at the, the ceremony. Um, that actually made me um, quite unpopular amongst my classmates. Um, and it was at this point that I started to have things thrown at me in class most days that I was there. Um, and then came this lovely newsletter that was published and sent out to all of the faculty, staff, students, and recent alumni, in which they talked about the beloved class president of the first year class, which was me. And in this particular newsletter, they talked about my black features, the width of my nose, the width of my ass, the contrast of my teeth to my skin color. And this was sent out broadly to thousands of individuals to guess, pay homage to who I was as an individual as I sought to fight injustice. So if that was my introduction to what my experience would be in medicine, all of these are practicing physicians throughout this country, you can imagine how I have kind of come in with guns blazing, ready to fight, but recognizing that even, even in a situation where I'm qualified to be there doing good work, making sure we acknowledge those that have been overlooked, that it yielded um, negative outcomes for me. Despite what I was experiencing in my class, I went on to do quite a bit of research. This is me winning the National Student or Eastern Student Research Forum, winning the Student National Medical Association Research Forum. I went on to win the National Student Research Forum. So I was able to still persevere despite the fact that if I went to class, I would have things thrown at me or whatever it was. Um, and just had to have that resiliency to push forward despite all else. It was in medical school that I wrote my first book. Um, I oversaw the whole Deja Review series for McGraw-Hill. Um, these are some of my awards and honors from um, my medical school years. This is me on graduation day. So, you know, if you looked at these pictures, you'd be like, oh, things were great. Um, obviously, you know, it was quite treacherous. And I learned like early that I can't rely on my medical colleagues to be there to be supportive, to be there to encourage the work that I do. I took a little bit of a detour um, and did right after undergrad a year of orthopedic surgery sports medicine fellowship in New York City. Um, I did my research at Hospital for Special Surgery and operated in Staten Island. Um, so this is my time during the, that work. Um, and then shifted over. One correction to Sherry's work, I was at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina, which is where I did my internal medicine pediatrics residency. And you could see that I was very interested in obesity work then. This is my time at the Discovery Channel here in the bottom and, and receiving one of my earlier AMA awards as a resident. Um, this work brought me significant joy and fulfillment, often using organized medicine to feel supported um, and the work that I did and obviously have continued in that, that realm over the last 20 years. 
Um, and MedPeds residency. So exercise is my favorite thing. If I weren't talking to you guys, that's exactly what I would be doing right now. So you can see me and my, my workout things. And I love presenting research. Research is, is something that I've enjoyed presenting. My early exposure to this work as a high school student really has set me up for the ability to be able to communicate my research. And, you know, this is me doing that while I was in my MedPeds residency. That brought me to the work in, in the ACP, the American College of Physicians. At the AMA, you can see me here. I was the, sp the speaker right before the American Medical Association voted to acknowledge obesity as a chronic disease in 2013. Um, it was a delight to be kind of flown in to specifically speak to the House of Delegates 12 hours before that landmark vote. Um, but I do, do think that we can say that that has changed the course of the work that we do, particularly the work that I do in obesity medicine. I went on to do my mid-career degree at the Harvard Kennedy School. I thought this was going to be my final degree. I called it my, my fourth and final, but now I'm on my fifth and final, and the alliteration still works. Um, this is with David Gerben. If any of you guys watch CNN, he was over the Center for Public Leadership and was very instrumental in making sure that even as someone who was still seeing patients throughout this entire time as a third-year obesity medicine fellow here at MGH, um, that I was able to do and be actively engaged in my work at the Kennedy School. And so then I have gone on to do a lot of work in mentoring. This is me receiving the Selfie uh, District Community um, Award for um, the Massachusetts Medical Society and my work in mentoring many students, residents, and fellows. I over, also oversee um, the NIH's efforts under NIDDK to improve um, diversity in um, the ranks um, at the NIH. So this was the first diversity scholars program um, as in my work as the diversity scholar leader for the Nutrition Obesity Research Center here at Harvard. Um, and this work brings me significant joy and, and gratification. So let's take a little bit of a transition as, as we looked at my life. And now let's go into some of the, the hard data that we know about um, what we're seeing in medicine. And what we know is that Black or African-American applicants have lower medical school acceptance rates than peer applic applicants. And what you can see, this is taken from the AAMC data, so the American Association of Medical Colleges. You can see that overall the acceptance for uh, Black and African-Americans is, is the lowest um, compared to other groups. And in 2015, what we do know is that in terms of medical school graduates, if we're looking at Black and Latinx individuals, 6% um, were African-American or Black, and 5% five per were Hispanic or Latino. So when we're looking at um, just the sheer volume of individuals that are, that are coming out of medical school, whether it's Stanford or Harvard or wherever, um, we can see that it is still relatively low. Now, this question is, I think, extremely important. I want us to focus on what we're seeing here in the Black or African-American community. And this question is as follows from the AAMC. And you can see um, that they've captured this data 2005, 2010, and 2015. And this question is very simple. And that is, do you plan to work in an underserved area? And I think that we, we don't have to be rocket scientists to be able to look and see that the community or the group of individuals that are in medical school that are most likely to want to work in an underserved area is by far the black community. Yet we saw that we have a lower likelihood of being accepted and a very low graduation rate um, of Black applicants. But this has been persistent over time. You can see that this is followed by Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. Um, and then also we can see the American Indian or Alaska Native population there. But we can see that within the Black and African American community that this is a huge part of who we are, is to serve the community that we've come from. So let's look at academia. What do we see in academia? We see that 39% of full-time faculty are female and only 4% of full-time faculty are Black, Hispanic, Native American, or Native Hawaiian. So 4% is the representation. And this is amongst all the underrepresented minorities in American medical schools. That means that when we have students coming in, being educated, they don't see people that reflect who they are. That means that we have issues with retention because it doesn't seem like it's feasible for something for them to accomplish. But this is based on AAMC data. And what you can see here is just the, the share of the pie. Who are our medical students? Who are we seeing? Obviously, we expect this to be the largest um, piece of the pie here is white, followed by Asian. 
um, populations. And then we see the black and, you know, we see kind of really small slivers of the pie here when we start to, to kind of look at where, what are the other, um, where the underrepresented minorities being known. There's this big unknown category. Um, this is, of course, based upon self-report from AAMC. So just want to make sure that you're aware of that also. So what happens when people do decide to go into academia? Um, these are two different studies or, that were um, captured first in the New York Times in 2011. Um, there was a study that came out of the NIH that said black scientists are less likely to win federal research grants. This is their own internal study, which indicates this. And then fast forward to 2019 and the NIH, and this you can see, I took this directly from their website. It shows that research topics contribute to the persistent gap in NIH research grants to Black scientists. So if, for example, you note in your application that you want to study disparities or issues regarding inequities, that automatically um, puts you out of the funding pool. Um, and so they actually studied this across several institutes within NIH and actually saw this to be the case. So that means that if you're going into academics, you're thinking about being a physician scientist or a scientist in some way, you're a black individual, you recognize that the odds are against you with regards to getting funding just because of what topic you decide to study, not necessarily the merit of your application. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about racial profiling. And racial profiling is um, an act of injustice that uses race as the foundation for shaping perceptions and behaviors associated with defining who is and which groups are criminal. It's set to disadvantage individuals from racial and ethnic minority groups. It's applied to stigmatize, to stereotype, and to target. And in this picture on your left, you see individuals that have been killed by police here in the United States, Trayvon Martin, for example, Renisha McBride, and different um, individuals, Eric Garner, for example, um, this is just a small representative sample of many of the faces that we were seeing really demonstrating to us that being a Black person, um, particularly a Black male, um, really raises the likelihood that you will succumb to violence, even if you're not doing anything wrong, just living. And so this, this leads me to us talking about the attributes to in and out group membership. This is a, a paper that came out in just in 2021. So just this is fresh off the press in January. And this helps us to frame how we think about them versus us. OK, so let's talk about us. We're the good people, right? We're, we're good. We're law abiding. We're peacekeepers. We're trustworthy, civilized, innocent. We're for civil rights, um, you know, sacred. Anyone in the, that other group, you know, is evil. They're criminals, brutal expansionists, untrustworthy, subject to tyranny, um, barbaric, oppressive, offensive, guilty, okay? And this idea of this in and out group membership, this juxtaposition really leads us to these issues of racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, and homophobia. We need to undo this binary consideration of in versus out in terms of our group membership. These faces should be very familiar to each of you. This is George Floyd. We have Ahmaud Arbery. We have Breonna Taylor. These faces rose to prominence in 2020 after they were killed by police and really began to stir up a conversation of race unlike any I've ever seen during my lifetime. What we learned is that it doesn't matter what they're doing or what they're not doing, that unfortunately they will be killed. And the difference between the previous individuals and these individuals is that this was during the middle of a pandemic. And so you saw different demonstrations that occurred as a reflection of this. I'm gonna play, this is directly from my window. So right behind me, I live in downtown Boston. You may not hear the sound, um, but I do wanna play it. If you do hear the sound, fine. If not, I'll explain what it is. It's very brief, like 12 seconds. live in Boston today is May 31st, 2020. We're at the corner of Washington and Avery Street. And as you can see, this crowd keeps coming as they turn down Avery Street and I presume head to the Boston Common. We're angry. We can't take this anymore. This works. 
So if you weren't able to hear what I was saying, I was really just capturing what was going on. This was the end of May of 2021 directly from my winter window. This crowd came down this primary street here in Boston for about an hour. So we expect that there were maybe a one and a half million individuals that decided to go out with regards to Black Lives Matter protest. And it just demonstrates, you know, the fury that individuals had after constantly seeing this, sitting at home as they social distance during the middle of this pandemic and constantly see individuals being shot and killed. Um, what we saw was the American Medical Association, a group that has historically, unfortunately, also had its issues with racism. A lot of people are unaware that in order to be on the staff of many hospitals in the United States in the early 1900s until up until even the mid and um, 1900s, you had to be a member of the American Medical Association. However, if you were a black physician, you were not allowed membership in the American Medical Association. It wasn't until 2008 that the current president of the AMA at the time actually apologized to black medical students, physicians, residents, fellows about the fact that we were not included and were excluded. And so you can see that as a sharp contrast to what we were seeing in 2020 when the chair of the board of trustees, Jesse Earnfield, and the president of the AMA at the time, Patrice Harris, came out in their own special report against police brutality, particularly against black and brown communities. So when we talk about systemic racism, we're talking about structural and legalized systems that result in differential access to goods and services, including healthcare services. We've talked about that during this presentation. There's cultural racism, which is negative and harmful racial stereotypes that are portrayed in culturally shared media and experiences. And then finally, interpersonal racism, which is implicit and explicit racial prejudice which includes explicitly expressed racist beliefs and implicitly held racist attitudes and actions based upon or resulting from these prejudices. And so we've seen the AMA, we've seen the American Public Health Association come out in strong um, support of undoing both systemic, cultural, and interpersonal racism. But I grew up in the American South. My parents were born during the Jim Crow era where even the waiting rooms for seeing physicians were segregated by color. This is a white coats for black lives demonstration outside of the ether dome at Mass General Hospital. Um, you can see that there appears to be significant solidarity. And I said appears on purpose because just because we do demonstrations like this doesn't mean that it leads to any change that's felt by an individuals like myself. And so one of the pieces that I commented on this in was the Forbes just a week after this demonstration. And that, you know, the, the comment or the title of that particular piece was that black doctors need more than demonstrations. We need actual change. And so while I love these demonstrations and they were aesthetically pleasing and it looks even nice on my slide now, if we don't see change reflected from these demonstrations, it continues to hurt and hurts even more. It's more palpable. I'm going to play this. This should play out loud. This is going to be a video. This is about one and a half minutes, um, but let's, let's go with this. And I think I can see both Mary and Cher, if you can raise your, your thumbs, if you can hear. <laughs> I once saw a high school teacher lead a simple, powerful exercise to teach his class about privilege and social mobility. He started by giving each student a scrap piece of paper and asked them to crumple it up. Then he moved the recycling bin to the front of the room. He said, the game is simple. You all represent the country's population and everyone in the country has a chance to become wealthy and move into the upper class. To move into the upper class, all you must do is throw your wadded up paper into the bin while sitting in your seat. The students in the back of the room immediately piped up saying, this is unfair. They could see the rows of students in front of them had a much better chance. Everyone took their shots and as expected, most of the students in the front made it, but not all, and only a few students in the back of the room made it. He concluded by saying, the closer you were to the recycling bin, the better your odds. This is what privilege looks like. Did you notice how the only ones who complained about fairness were in the back of the room? By contrast, people in the front of the room were less likely to be aware of the privilege they were born into. All they can see is 10 feet between them and their goal. 
Your job as students who are receiving an education is to be aware of your privilege and use this particular privilege called education to do your best to achieve great things, all the while advocating for those in the rows behind you. So, you know, as we learn about privilege, white privilege, access and opportunities that people don't recognize that they have when they compare and contrast to groups that are disenfranchised, like the black and brown communities here in the United States, it's important for us to recognize that there is privilege. There's privilege even for myself as a black physician that's different from the black gentleman that's on the corner right now who needs money to go into the local drugstore. But privilege does exist and we need to be aware of our privilege. As when we're aware of our privilege, we're able to begin to make change. This particular piece I wrote in the New England Journal in January of this year, it's called Beyond Tuskegee, Vaccine Distrust and Everyday Racism. Um, when we talk about what we're seeing in terms of vaccination rates within the Black community particularly, we think it's based upon historical atrocities, Henrietta Lacks, J. Marion Sims, the Tuskegee experiment. And I argue and posit within this particular piece that it is not those historical atrocities that lead to distrust. It is everyday racism that leads to the distrust, even within and amongst the ranks of healthcare providers and institutions. What I have here is Dr. Susan Moore, who I do talk about in this New England Journal piece, a black physician, family physician who trained at the University of Michigan who died to COVID, documented her experience of her inadequate treatment um, in her hospitals in Indiana. And it really demonstrates that her privilege, her privilege of being a black doctor here in the United States did not bore any I guess, gravitas in terms of her being able to get the level of care that she needed to survive this very deadly disease that we call COVID-19. What we've actually seen is a decline in or a projected decline in life expectancy associated with COVID. Here you can see um, what the life expectancy was. This was an article that came out in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences just this year. And you can see that for the Black population, we were already significantly lower, and we expect that to taper off in terms of the projected. Projected notice is kind of this dash line. This is the white and total population. People do always are like kind of curious about this Latin population. I think that the Latin population has this perceived, um, I guess, increase in life expectancy. And I think a lot of it's because they don't decipher between Black Latinx or white Latinx. And so it kind of, um, you kind of get the benefits of both worlds being in that um, demonstration there. One test that I do encourage you to take if you have not already taken it is the RACE IAT, which is the RACE Implicit Association Test. It is a free test provided here at Harvard. There are several other implicit association tests like ones regarding weight and other issues. Um, but what this really does is it tells you what your preferences are. Do you have a strong preference for only interacting with white individuals or black individuals? I actually took the test again last night. Um, if you guys want to know what my answers are, you'll have to get that in the Q&A. Um, but I wanted to see, you know, kind of where I, I land, where I fall. I fell where I have fallen previously um, in terms of what my preferences are as it relates to kind of this black-white dichotomy. When we are learning to become anti-racist, I think it's important to recognize that there are three primary zones by which you'll travel. There's the fear zone, um, where you deny racism as a problem, you strive to be comfortable, comfortable. There's the learning zone, where you'll be vulnerable about your own biases and knowledge gaps and seek out questions that may make you feel uncomfortable, for example. And then we want people in that growth zone where you sit with your discomfort, you educate your peers about how racism harms our profession of medicine. You yield to positions, you yield positions of power to marginalized groups, which means giving up some things that may have been given to you to allow others to have other opportunities. That's just a, a kind of, I can't go through all of them, but just a few of the things. We're almost, we're basically at the end of the presentation. I'm going to end with this um, young black gentleman who um, is named Kedron Bryant. Um, and this song is extremely emotional. This is what I had them play at the closing of the AMA meeting this um, past July. Um, I think it really reflects what we as black individuals feel. So I'll just let this play. 
I'm a young black man doing all that I can to stay. Oh, but when I look around and I see what's being done to my kind every day, I'm being haunted as prey. My people don't want no trouble. We've had enough struggle. I just want to live. God protect me. I just want to live. I just want to live. So in summary, um, there are various obstacles to being a part of the faculty at any institution as someone that's underrepresented. And concerted efforts to improve all facets of academic life for those that are underrepresented in medicine are indeed necessary. Strategies to address structural racism should be developed to allow for optimal academic success and productivity for sustainable change for faculty that are underrepresented in medicine. And these reflect um, some of the things that I posit um, that are potential strategies that I published in another piece um, that I published. Um, a few things that I think that I just wanna leave as take a home points of things that you can take tangibly and do um, here at Stanford and that I encourage here um, at National and at Harvard. We wanna ensure that diversity and inclusion is ingrained within the culture by making it integral to the mission and outputs within the organization. Next, you wanna integrate stakeholders from all levels of the organization, and ensure that all groups are included in discussions to enact and maintain diversity and inclusion efforts. Sustainability is key. You wanna share successes and failures with similar organizations, so peer institutions, as is this discourse that will allow the organization to reflect on strengths and weaknesses in previous diversity and inclusion strategies. And then finally, you want to start young. You want to engage with local communities and schools to ensure that persons from underrepresented groups get early exposure to the fields of medicine. It's only in that that we're going to see the numbers change, see this change such that we see better service for those that are underserved. I do want to thank you so much for your time today. I do hope that you learned a little bit about me, but a little bit about the work that we can do to make it better for people that look like me in medicine. Thank you so much for your time.